talking about uh, war in former Yugoslavia is, is not an easy thing, even 30 years after, because it was the first military conflict on European soil since 1945. This war has traumatized the populations and remains a wound in the heart of Europe. Uh, I think that we can all remember the terrible attacks against uh, civilians, ethnic and religious cleansing, the Srebrenica massacre, and that was in 95, with this kind of very strange non-intervention of the UN peacekeeping force, the Blue Helmet. There were the controversial NATO bombings in 1999, and so on and so on. The sad context uh, of our talk tonight is that the current situation in Bosnia is extremely tense so tense um, that a new conflict cannot be ruled out. But we will talk about that later at the end of the discussion with the public. And of course, uh, with you, Zoran and Nerina, let me please just introduce you. Zoran, you were born in uh, 1969 in Rijeka. You were a very well-known uh, writer and you have published nine books so far and won a lot of awards. The books have been translated into English, into Italian, Polish, Slovenian, and Ukrainian. And as you told me very uh, recently, um, there was one book that has been translated also into Serbian, which means a lot because it's the third part uh, of an anti-war trilogy. And all your books uh, talk about war between Croats and Serbs. The name of this book is Patient from Room 19. Berina, uh, you were born in uh, Jakova, Kosovo, in 1982. You are a poet, essayist, and journalist. To date, you've published three collections of poems and won several awards. Your poems and essays have been published in distinguished international anthologies and journals, and have been translated into many languages. And today, you work as a journalist for radio journal your radio journalist for the BBC, and the most important columnist for the Kosovo newspaper, Zeri. You both featured on Vox Europe in the series of his say, essays, Archipelago Yugoslavia, that we published on the 30 years after the war, together with four other authors from ex-Yugoslavia, from former Yugoslavian republics. And this series was published, as we said, in collaboration with Traduki and the S. Fischer Foundation. So we will start with, um, uh, with some memories, so Katya, memories of the past that, that collapsed. <laughs> If it's right. fun with you. Yes, I thought it would be important to, to talk about the state that collapsed, former Yugoslavia. Zoran, I already said it, you were born in 69, uh, so that was at the end of the golden age of Tito's Yugoslavia, was in the 60s. Can you tell us what memories do you have of former Yugoslavia? What this, did this country mean or maybe still means to you? <clears throat> well, um... That's the country in which I was born, you know, and in which I spent my youth in. So only by that, my memories of that place are nothing but positive. You know what I mean? So, but I believe that we all have positive and happy memories on our youth. Uh, same way I believe that a person that grow in poverty, for example, will still like to travel back in time, not for the poverty, but because of childhood. So, yeah, that's pretty much all, actually. When I'm thinking about Yugoslavia, I'm thinking about positive, positive uh, things, you know. Uh, I tried uh, not to compare this country with, uh, with Croatia today because it is quite impossible. So when someone asked me about Yugoslavia, my children, for example, they asked me, how was in Yugoslavia? I said, it was fine. I was happy enough. <laughs> I was a kid, you know. Everything uh, what was important for me happens. So, yeah, that's pretty much all. Okay, thank you. So, I uh, have a question about the past for you, Berina. You were born in 1982, two years after Tito's death, a period of political confusion mm -hmm. and first violence conflict between Serbs and Albanians in Kosovo. And you wrote for us an essay called The Better Life That Never Was. Uh, your parents were born when the Yugoslavian experiment was just beginning. And you wrote that your parents were, I quote, inspired by the famous Yugoslavian slogan, 
uh, Bordi Jivot, Jivot, I hope I pronounced mm -hmm. that, this is his motto, <laughs> that peace would last a hundred years. And I just wanted to know how you, you experienced it and uh, what did you tell, uh, what did they tell you about it, about that period? Uh, thank you very much, Catherine. I'm happy to be tonight here with you. And uh, my memories, in fact, uh, of this, what uh, of about this, your uh, question. When I was a little child, I, we, we, I used to, to hear that, that the better life was before. It wasn't a better life, but it was better than the, than the life after I was born, because it started with those uh, turmoil things, politic things, uh, demonstrate and, and uh, closing schools and uh, military in the street, having a lot of protests during uh, all the time. I was, I was six or seven and eight and I was used with it. And uh, I always asked them if it was better before. They said that it was better in economic way uh because they had jobs and uh they continue to have it till uh, 90 and uh, it was it was it was it was a kind of dream dreaming what it was before that bad time where when i was growing up and uh the time after it uh, everything uh, started to become worse and worse so it I was born when everything started to collapse till the till the end of war, I think. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that, Zoran, that, that was not your case. I think as a teenager, you experienced uh, the political and the economic crisis in former Yugoslavia. And of course, the beginning of nationalism on all sides. Um, how did you live that period? Can you remember when you did when you realized that Yugoslavia maybe would break down? Yeah, that's a good question. Hmm. Um, it wasn't easy, actually, you know, because the evaluation of all values happened basically overnight. Uh, both actually economic values and human ones. And uh, maybe the hardest thing to proceed was the fact that uh, some of our close friends suddenly become advocates of nationalistic ideologies. And it was mostly those young people that couldn't manage to find themselves in anything such a, as sports, of arts, music or school and things like that, you know? So therefore they open-handedly accepted the newly created situation in which they had uh, like-minded people, they felt stronger and safer with. So that's the period I remember as a time when, let's say we start to hanging out with people of same, same opinions and ideas and we try actually it's funny, but it's true, uh, to avoid people we didn't agree with. So uh, those were ideas which uh, foundation were built on nationalism, which wasn't something myself or people similar to me found to be a relevant factor in our life. So we preferred uh, social gathering built around some completely other uh, cultural values. So if I was been asking uh, in 90s, I will split Yugoslavia on two parts. You know, one would contain normal people and the other one would uh, have the idiots, no matter what nationality they were. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I have uh, another question for you, uh, Verena. Your, your parents hope your road was destroyed overnight when you were watching the BBC, the BBC news with your father about the start of the NATO uh, bombing campaign against Serbia and that you also start that actually started the war with Kosovo. The, the Serbian revenge came quickly. Uh, mm. I'm quoting, we became nothing and nobody overnight. Refugees and we had to leave our house. So what, what happened next? What happened after it? After it, um, 
after the bombing night, we just we started to escape uh, house to house, and uh, you just realize in those moments that you you don't know who you are. You don't you know just you are trying to avoid death and to to survive, but you you don't have hope. You 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 know that. Uh, you will be in the street, you will be in someone someone else's house. For example, I was in a house of someone that I didn't know. We are all my family and others. And you, you start to live a kind of life uh, that is very strange. You don't understand it. And you think that everything, all your life, uh, everything that you had just has, just, it's gone. It's not anymore. And, um, uh, you start to live in in fear and as i mentioned in the essay it's been uh, all the during uh, during the time of war in the city i used to sleep in my clothes and didn't wear pajamas anymore because it was that night bombing the last night that i wear pajamas and uh, uh you start you start to to confront, uh, to 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 you start to see and to feel the unimaginable things, and to to hear everything, to see everything, to see people dying in the street, to see bodies in the street, to see houses burning, and everything else that you cannot imagine it in real life. Thank you. Okay. Thank you if you don't um, have this experience. Uh, I remember that in your essay you wrote um, that you finally get used to the terrible emptiness. Uh, this is a quote. It sounds terrifying, but life with the feeling that tomorrow it could all be over again. But we turned out to be amazingly robust. Uh, how did you grow this feeling? And do you feel it until today? Uh, can you explain it more to me? Because uh, you you mean about okay the emptiness before war or after it? Mm. Both. Um, if if there were both. Yes. Uh, as as a child, we were always talking about the Great Revolution. You mentioned in the beginning the Tito eras, and I. I didn't have those uh, red uh, scarves, red things that pioneers had in the school. And we were joking with things that were before and we were just kids uh, dreaming about revolution and dreaming about a big revolution. And when we saw that things didn't change and things just get worse, I mean, before war, during the nineties, because uh, uh, everything started just in early 90s or before and before it, uh, when the dream of revolution became something that uh, was just waiting for it, I, I just, uh, I became very introvert and very close in myself, in my room, my home, in my, in my life, in my, it was, it was very, very, very strange because um, we had also funny moments for example, uh, getting out of school to go into the protest. It was danger being there, but we love to be in there because we saw ourselves as uh, little heroes that are trying to change the world. That was the thing. And uh, after war is a different story, but uh, it is more. it was more hard after war than before it, I think, because before the war we had a dream, and I had then I was very ide idealist, and I had the dream that uh, after everything finished, it will be everything great. It was just a dream, and then we started everything from zero from the beginning, and it was very hard. Yeah. Kathleen? Yeah, you, you, you just mentioned the, the, the dream. So you actually, you did write that you became a dreamer at that very period. And is it a time when you started thinking about poetry, maybe as a survival tool? Or? Yes, yes, it was that time when I used to 
to read a lot, a lot, all the time. And when I start writing poems, my first poem, and um, I just dreamed other cities, other countries, other places that I used to see in TV and I couldn't visit them because the situation was like it was and we we couldn't afford any travel to Europe or to somewhere else. I just used to hear stories from my parents and from others grown up that uh, they used to travel a lot uh, in the in the different states of uh, in the states of Yugoslavia and in New York and in Europe. But uh, I was really I was really wishing and willing to to do it, but we couldn't do it as a family in that time. And I just started dreaming. I just started dreaming it happened like this, uh, like that. And uh, I read a lot. And yes, I started writing poems in that time. And then I quit it, but <laughs> it was my first love with uh, writing. But then you quit it. And then you went. I, then I quit it. I started studying literature. And after my master's degree, doing my master's degree, I started writing again. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So we've already uh, started talking about the war experience, but we we are more now in that it's, that very period where that you also wrote about. And um, so I have a question uh, for Zoran. Uh, you became a, a soldier actually in the Croatian army during the war on the Croatian Serbian border from nineteen ninety one to the nineteen ninety five. Uh, and, and in the essay that we published on Vox Europe. You said, uh, the moment when I went to war, I was a long-haired youth in a punky leather jacket, 21 years old. Uh, when, uh, why did you decide to go to the army? Did, did you have the choice, actually? Yeah, actually, I had the choice. Everyone had the choice, especially me, because uh, my city, Rijeka, is not close to border. So actually, we didn't... Uh, we wasn't involved in war at all. So I was volunteer as my friends as well from my city, but things are very clear here. You know, uh, Serbian politics by Slobodan Milosevic attacked my country after we proclaimed independence and country had to be defend. So, but uh, when I say the country, I don't mean just the country itself, but the bare lives as well. So Serbian side bombed civil buildings, civilians and had, uh, that had nothing to do with the war. Uh, the civilians were taken away from their houses to be killed. Entire villages, uh, Croatian villages were just simply disappeared. There was a race. Uh, children was dying. So someone had to step up against that madness, you know. Uh, when you are surrounded by that uh, kind of uh, energy, uh, it's very hard to clearly thinking about anything else but what is a good and what is a right. And that wasn't right. No one had the right to take a gun in, in their hands, you know, and to shut the people. There's no such a reason to do that, you know. So that's the, my story, you know, but... Unfortunately, um, talking about war, uh, the war encouraged the growth of nationalism on the both sides, and that's the truth. And as well as making a profit from the war itself on the both sides as well. So that is why war trauma has been replaced by trauma of other kinds for many people. So. After the war, all we want to, uh, wanted was to continue leaving uh, where it's left off, but that was impossible because racists and criminals were becoming too powerful. Uh, they are in our leading positions, you know, in our country, in my country, for example, everything, but everything is ruled by completely incompetent and unqualified people. Here we used to say in Croatia, every country in the world has a mafia. Only here in Croatia, mafia has the country. And maybe now is the right, uh, right time to, to say something about my, my books. So, uh, because uh, my books are 
mm. deeply connected with the uh, with this topic. So, in my books, I'm trying to set an idea of war being finished as well as past being non-existing in the present. So it happens once and now it's gone. And only thing actually uh, worth fighting for is our future. And future cannot be built on the hate. And we felt the hate, we felt the hate, the strong hate, and it's brought nothing good for us. And every traumatizing experience will come to, uh, and, and if you decide to focus your mind on something that does you good, you know what I mean? If you, for example, I'll give you an example. If you lost someone close or you had trauma caused by, I don't know, let's say car accident or anything else, if you keep thinking about it or talking, talking about it, the trauma will be um, your life main focal point actually. But if you change your perspective, you could keep living a good quality life filled with uh, lessons from previous experiences without falling into the same traps like you used to. So another thing is uh, I'm trying to put closer to readers is that there's no such thing as black and white world. There's no such thing. Uh, Serbia was aggressor in that war and they attacked every Republic they proclaimed independence. They start the war in Slovenia. They start the war in Bosnia. They start the war in Croatia as well. And their issues with Kosovo are ongoing for 40 years. And speaking of that, it's clear who started war. There's no doubt about it. But on the other hand, in every war, including this one, it happens in Croatia, both sides participate in spread of racism, of nationalism based, based on hate and that of many innocent people, especially children. So that's something we cannot allow to happen again. And I also deeply believe, I hope, no, actually I not hope, I believe that it won't happen because youth on these areas are oriented pro-European. So their views are much modern than they accept differences on the much better way than my generation. Okay. And Zolan, how did you come to writing? You said it's, it's not a choice, but you have to write about uh, your war experience. Yeah, yeah, that's um, actually, I started writing actually to stop thinking about the war, to be honest with you. That was the main reason actually why I started to write. Because uh, when I left the battlefield, actually, when I, when I get back in, 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 let's say normal life, I feel a little bit lost because uh, I lost some of my good friends, you know, and it wasn't easy. Even now, 30 years ago, uh, after a really hard topic to, uh, for me, you know, but mm -hmm. the thing is that I chose the writing actually, or writing is true me, I don't know, because, um, I have to keep my mind busy with something else, you know? And in that moment, I ask myself why my friends are died, why I'm uh, still here. And things like that actually drives you crazy, you know, because there's no right answer on that. So that's the reason why I start to write. And I don't know, I just finished my 10th book actually two weeks ago and I'm writing for the last 20 years. So I had a gap from 10 years gap actually between, uh, between uh, to my civilian life and when I start to, to writing, I didn't sleep for 10 years actually, I had insomnia mm -hmm. and it was huge suffering, not just for me and for my family as well. Yeah. So yeah, uh, on the end, I just, I can say that I was lucky. 
Mm -hmm. I was lucky actually because uh, now I, I think that my biggest um, victory, let's say, my biggest victory after all is that I don't hate anyone. Mm -hmm. I'm just happy that I'm here with you guys tonight and that's it. Life goes on. That's it. Thank you for this very strong um, sentence. Yes. yes. I can remember that we, we already talked about it and you even said that uh, sometimes you were feeling more close to a, to a Serbian soldier that had the same age as you than to your Croatian uh, colleagues, <laughs> if I might say, uh, that had this dream of defending something that, that was not your case. Yeah, but that's normal thing. If you if you think about it, it's it's quite normal, you know, because we lived in in the same country, you know, in Yugoslavia. We can say that Yugoslavia was experiment, but I didn't I didn't know that, and I didn't care about it. You know, when you're 19 or 20, you're not involved in politics. You don't care about politics, you know. So, I had friends I don't know from all around Yugoslavia. I never ask anyone, are you Serb or Bosnian or Croatian or Macedonian or Albanian? I simply didn't care, you know? So actually that question is pop up on 91, actually, when the war, war started. That was important at that moment. Before that, it, it wasn't, you know? So yeah, in the one moment, actually, I find myself on the battlefield and I was 20, 21 and my enemy on the other side was the guy of the same age as I am. So actually, we have grown on the same music, on the same books, on the same movies. And you have to ask yourself, what's going on here, guys? You know, so actually, I have to shoot that guy because otherwise he will shoot me. And But maybe a couple of weeks ago, we was together at some club or some pub, drinking a beer, having a good time. You know what I mean? So yeah, that, that, that's something that's actually, it's really hard to explain, but I don't know, I don't know what to say. I just can say actually that I feel I deeply feel sorry for every life and every family who has lost someone in that war on the both sides. Thank you, Zoran. Thank you. Um, Lerina, uh, you wrote in, in the paper that the most terrible day of the war for you uh, was the first day of liberation. And I quote, I felt more exhausted than ever before. The house was there, but our souls only came with difficulty. So what memory do you have from um, about former Yugoslavia and uh, you also mentioned your son in, you know, before you also talked about your parents, but your son and your son, and how did you mm. talk about, to your son about it? Yes, um, I come from Jafova, and Jafova was one of the cities that was most uh, damaged and most uh, the city who had uh, a lot of people killed from uh, Serbian military and paramilitary. And we, we really experienced it. Uh, a lot of um, horrible things there and um, that was why it was hard the first day of liberation about this it was personal and it was impersonal because uh, during those days of war I, I really uh, I was executed because uh, executed because I had a I couldn't sleep. Also, like Zoran said, I had um, that's, that's, that kind of insomnia. I feared to sleep. And uh, the first day of uh, liberation, the first day of our freedom, it was strange because we came out from houses and went uh, in the center center of the city, and we were surprised how many people were hiding in different places we couldn't believe that we that because the city looked like uh, just a 
like a uh, phantasma city. And we couldn't, we couldn't, uh, phantasmagoric city, we couldn't believe how many people were standing in the center of it. And um, we were pale, we were uh, uh, lost, I felt lost, I felt strange, I felt, uh, I felt very weird. I didn't know, okay, now is the first day, what to do next? How should I continue my life in this new situation, in this new world, in this free world? What should I do? It was, it was uh, very difficult to, to commit myself to something else. The school were closed and we were uh, waiting to start in September because it was uh, it was uh, June, the end of the middle of June, and uh, we were just wondering what to do now. I I remember seeing people, everyone, people coming back who were migrants, who were uh, sent out from Kosovo, coming back from Albania, coming back from, uh, especially from Albania, because my city is in the border with Albania, and people telling a horrible story, telling everything that happened to them during uh, their their uh, uh, road as refugees. Uh, people uh, telling uh, different uh, story from the nights and days uh, during the war and uh, everything was a kind of uh, everyone telling their traumas without understanding them in that time. Everyone trying to, to testify what a horrible time they went through. And uh, I mean, France and then I know that a lot of my in first days we asked for our school friends and our uh, neighbor friends. A lot of people were missing. A lot of my friends were killed and were missing. And we were we are not surprised anymore because we knew it. But it was hard to accept it and to continue to go further. It was uh, it was difficult just to go further but uh, then uh, it was summer we started uh, it was a kind of uh, uh, with neighbors and with friends it was a kind of uh, uh, a mass understanding of what happened and just going putting a step into a new life then school started and things uh, seemed to to go normal but uh, it took time to be in a different world, in a different life, and in 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 normal life. Uh, I for this uh, writing that this essay uh, called "Easy Life." I understood. I was. It was very uh, difficult for me to write it, and I understood that I didn't wrote a lot about about the experiences and memories of uh, of war time. I always tried to avoid it, to escape from it, and uh, that's not uh, the bad. That's not the good thing. It, I maybe I should write. I should have write for it more, but um, maybe as Zoran said. Sometimes we have to wait when times come to deal with it, to have it in front of yeah. us. Mm -hmm. I can see in the chat that um, there are some questions about how is today's life in your new states. So Zalan, I would like to ask you, how did you experience Croatia becoming independent and a member of the European Union? So promulgation of Croatian independence was something that I welcomed without many emotions. Uh, don't get me wrong, all right? But I was 20 and my focus was set to other things I, I mentioned earlier, you know? So Croatia actually is left one association and entered the other one, the NATO and European Union. And tomorrow maybe my country could be in the third one. So I never had too much feelings toward that. For me, 
borders are nothing more but lines on the world map. You know what I mean? So I was interested in spiritual surroundings. Uh, I live in people that are around me and not politics. You know, people are not described by their nationality or origins, but their but, uh, but by their actions. So yeah, uh, European Union is maybe the best thing that happens to Croatia actually, but I'm not very exciting about it, to be honest with you, you know, because finally I'm from Rijeka. Uh, my city is very close to Italy. And in the past actually is just hundred years, my city has changed nine countries nine countries. So maybe that's the, that's the root, actually. That's the reason why uh, I'm pretty much skeptical about associations and, and stuff like that. You told me that you uh, lived abroad, you lived in Ireland, and uh, then you come back with your family to, to Croatia uh, not a long time ago. And if I understand you, it's not easy for you to live in Croatia. You're very um, critical with your with the Croatian people. What what are the main problems? Do you think of this society now? Hmm. Main problem? You mean main problem uh, in Croatia, generally speaking? Uh, well, um, Croatia's biggest issue is a very low standard of, of life. That's the biggest problem. Uh, unemployment high prices, low wages and pensions. Uh, I will give you an example. So minimum wage for a full-time job in Croatia is less than 500 euros for, uh, for month. So that's the same money actually that I can earn in Ireland for one week. And the reason for that is, of course, that's my opinion, it's corruption. Uh, one political party buying enough voters, which is the result for their leadership for the past 30 years. And following current state, it's not going to change anytime soon. Uh, majority of people on all positions and levels are connected to the leading party members by families or by business lines. So that party is basically let me be clear, uh, they're a criminal organization. And that's the thing uh, that, uh, known to everyone. Uh, but they, they got spread among society like a plague, which makes any progress hardly possible. I mean, the leading party is officially convicted for corruption by Croatian Supreme Court. So, they ministers, for example, are either in prison or under investigation for money laundering. The Prime Minister, Ivo Sanader, is currently in the prison for illegal enrichment. And he is currently sentenced uh, to eight years in prison. Right now, that, that guy is in prison. So those are our... And we could easily uh, conclude that Croatia wasn't created to have a future, you know, but was created for 100 privileged families who become the rich while my generation was dying in the war for independence. And long-term projects, for example, that's the one of the main topics in Croatia. So long-term projects that will get the country out of crisis are non-existent at all. Politicians are only involved in topics that support simplicity, such as racism and hate based on nationality. 30 years after war, people are busy talking about their previous suffering and traumas. They're forgetting to worry about not being capable to find an even a lowest paid job without political connections, which is in the end won't be enough to even pay the bills and put the foot on the table, mm -hmm. you know? But okay, uh, there's a good thing in everything, right? And good thing is, as always, the younger generations, the young people, 
The, young, the younger generations, generation of Croatian sexual are putting the efforts into migrating to other countries of European Union. Uh, the moment they finish their education, mostly uh, they plan to go to Ireland or Germany, and actually they don't show any interest in coming back. So maybe, maybe someone now thinking, okay, these guys are completely crazy, but I think there's the good thing for them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, um, uh, Larina, I have uh, like two questions in one really. So, of course, how do you see now the situation in Kosovo uh, today? Um, and what are the fears and hope, hopes of the population uh, to take part of the question asked by Tim Bellon in the, in the chat? Yeah, the situation here in Kosovo now is very complex or is very easy. Uh, complex. Yeah, it's complex, but uh, sometimes uh, uh, we have uh, we have the main problem with uh, politic narratives from Serbia uh, denying the reality in Kosovo, which then has its consequences on our on our on a lot of our uh, things with our state. We have uh, issues with visa. We still cannot. If I mentioned in essay that we couldn't travel then, we still cannot travel now. Mm. Twenty years after war, we we need we need a visa to travel to everywhere in Europe, anywhere beside uh, Montenegro, Albania, and Turkey, and uh, we are we don't have that. We still don't have that freedom uh, about what we fight and what we hope and what we dream in that time uh now the you may know that our government uh, our government has changed our political uh, power has changed we have a new a new prime minister we have a new party in the in uh, in the government in the power now uh, which is more uh, socialist and it's, it's more uh, it's different from what it was before then and uh, we had and we are we had a lot of hope and we are still hoping that things will change but uh, we're still waiting to see it I don't believe it actually like like it's from it is promoting um but if if zoran if zoran mentioned that in croatia uh the average of uh salary is uh 500 in kosovo is less than 300 um we we know we we are um uh, we still have the most number of unemployed people, uh, even that we have the generation that it, it is a uh, very young generation, very young. Uh, uh, we have a lot of young people that are able to work, but they cannot find work. And as in other countries in Balkan, but uh, in ex Yugoslavia and in the but exclusively in Kosovo, the young generation, the young people are just uh, uh, looking to, to go abroad, to, to, to go in, the, uh, in, most, in, in other countries, like in West countries in Europe, to find the good jobs and to have a good life. Because what we miss still is having a, a normal life. I mean, a normal life. We have it without fear, without war, but we still have that silent war from Serbia in every day in their narratives during to, uh, in, in, in our relation. Uh, uh, we have that fear of uh, not finding bread to put in the table not having a perspective in, in a lot of profession, not having, a, you, mentioned, you mentioned before, you mentioned that thing with my, with my son, me, myself, I never, I never thought that I will want to go away from Kosovo. But now that I'm mom, I, when I see my, my son that, uh, I, when I think about his future, I really, I really become very sad that knowing I don't want him to experience what I experienced in my career and my profession 
in Kosovo after after the after the war till now. Uh, I don't want him and other uh, young children, young uh, students to experience that this kind of uh, disillusion, this kind of uh, uh, disappointment with with our society, with our uh, state, with our country. Thank you, Blerina. Um, yeah, let's talk maybe about the, the, the future also. I, I, I said it at the beginning of our discussion that the situation in Bosnia is uh, very tense at the moment. Um, maybe I can uh, say a few words about the situation because it might be not be very clear to, to everybody. Um, there's a problem at the moment because uh, since the end of the Bosnian war in 95 and following the Dayton peace agreement, there are three entities coexisting in Bosnia, the Bosnians, the Croats and the Serbs, and they share common institutions and the country's rules in turn by the three entities. This is since uh, 26 years. What happened now is uh, the ultra-nationalist Serb leader in Bosnia, Milovat Dodik, uh, announced that the country's Serb entity will quit the key state institutions, so the armed forces, tax administration, and so on. And he wants to replace them by Serb-only institutions um, to strengthen the, the position of, of uh, Serbs in, in Bosnia. He says that this is not a secession and there is possibility for war, but a lot of analysts uh, say that it cannot be excluded. Uh, what do you think about this situation? This is a question for both of you. If everything started in that uh, line that uh, denying the genocide in Bosnia, yes. I mean that that's the main cue of main key of everything of uh, Serbian narrative and those ideologies that are still. Uh, very vivid in our lives and in our politics, denying everything that happened. And uh, just uh, continuing to, to fill us with uh, them in Bosnia and here in Kosovo with fear. I, 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 I really, I'm, I don't know what will happen, but uh, I wish that nothing like that happened. But uh, even if you don't have a, a that war in, in, in literally uh, meaning of the word, you have different wars that you have to face. So it's enough, it's enough. People are, are very tired, even there and here and everywhere, living with these ideologies and, and uh, living with this uh, support or hearing every day these lies, hearing every day this kind of uh, mean things. And uh, we just, we, I I like I would like to to have uh, a normal life without this thing, uh, a normal life trying to understand each other better, maybe creating uh, maybe creating uh, uh, a lot of communication together. For example, uh, artistic communication, cultural communication, building bridges. That's the most important thing that could happen, but it's not happening. Yeah, thank you, Verena Zoran. And maybe having in mind also, as a second question, uh, um, can we expect anything from Europe as, as maybe in a role of mediator? That's the second question then. I'll get back to you, Verena, for, for that. But maybe Zoran first on the situation in Bosnia. Okay. Yeah, so to be honest with you guys, I'm not very familiar, uh, familiar with the recent situation in Bosnia, you know, because there's always something happening in Bosnia, you know, uh, but even if I was, I think it will be not be polite of me to comment the situation in another country will at the same time my country is run by criminals. And all I know in that situation now in Bosnia that is so complex and complicated that even Bosnians don't really understand. Mm -hmm. So 
thing that I'm certain on is that the only motive for Croatians, Serbians, and Bosnians leaders in Bosnia and Herzegovina is money and power. The only motive. Um, and look, look uh, let me say on this way. So children of rich and powerful Serbian families are very good friends with the rich and powerful children of Croatian and Bosnian families. Will in same time, the poor people hate each other, will not be able to put food on the, food on the table. And that's the, just a small fraction of the way deeper situation in Bosnia. Okay, I'll bring in some questions from the audience because we already passed our time. We said we would uh, we only took one actually. So it doesn't mean we can't keep on talking about the Bosnian situation, but maybe uh, I would ask Zoran the question from uh, Filippo. Uh, how do you feel about the emergence of Croatian civil society in the political scene, like the coalition of movements like Modern Mozemo or Zagreb, uh, Yenas, I probably don't pronounce it properly and so on. Yeah. Yeah, your pronouncing is very well, actually. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Zagreb and Nash and Mojimo, and Mojimo they're per, uh, perhaps the best thing that happens on the political scene in the last 30 years in Croatia, because the new people have come up with new ideas and uh, people support them. Uh, Mojimo had taken uh, rules, actually, the power in the Zagreb and a uh, big job of cleaning and awaiting, awaiting that uh, because the, uh, the former, uh, former, uh, let's say, uh, mayor and the people around him, actually, uh, Mr. Bandic, they left uh, Zagreb completely ruined economically. Uh, so yeah, actually, I support them. Definitely, I support them. But 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 there's one more thing. Actually, uh, I still thinking that uh, the faithful following uh, of the ruling party is still too strong. They're still too strong. You can't even imagine actually how deep they can get. Mm. Okay. So um, we have other questions. Uh, uh, yet again, you can answer the way you want if you want to talk again about the Western situation. That's absolutely okay. Uh, uh, it's up to you. Um, there's a question from uh, Walter uh, Walter Cosolino. Which informations? What informations are being given on the war in Yugoslavia in school books? In the, on the former Yugoslavian republics, his history thought in different ways in such books. So it may be very nice if you want to start. And then Doran, I'm up to you. Uh, I, I really don't know. I don't know. I think that, um, yes, you, you can read about the, I know about the, they have some, uh, in the history books, in the history books, I don't know how it's presented the the recent history. Okay. I'm not sure. I I know some things, but I cannot give you the right answer. Okay, and Zoran, do you know? Unfortunately, same thing, actually. Um, but look. Uh, it's like always, actually, each side has its own story, you know, so. For, for Serbian side, actually, the Serbian soldiers are brave. They are heroes. They did the same thing, actually, in Croatia with Croatian soldiers. So it's very, very hard to be objective, yeah, uh, actually. No, I don't know. I don't know. I can say anything what I think, but that's not right, actually, because I, I, I don't know the facts. OK. Um, there's a question uh, from Domenico Tinelli. Uh, following what Zoran said about the use of nationalism by some elites and families to get the power in Croatia, this is the question for Blerina. What do you think about the role of Kosovo, of the Kosovo Liberation Army and its epigones in Kosovo, 
did they have the same role in the current government? <laughs> uh, we have our ex-president in, in Hague. We have a lot of our uh, powerful people that ruled Kosovo afterwards in, in, in Haga, in jail, waiting for the judgment. And uh, yes, this was the, they were the powerful people that fight, that fought for us. They were the powerful people that uh, took the power. They were the power people that took everything that they, they were who get very rich and they took, they were the most powerful people in Kosovo. Now things started to change really in the last year because they are not here anymore. They, not, they don't have the power that they used to have before, but it, it isn't gone because it's a, it's a very, it's a very, uh, it's a network that maybe you don't see it in the, uh, you don't see it anymore like it was, but it is everywhere in the institution, in the government institution, in the, in the local institutions. And uh, I hope that that, that, uh, that era, the era of them had gone because uh, they were the heroes, and then they become the became the politicians uh, who took, who tried, and took everything just for themselves. Okay. And then I was like me. Most of the people were very disappointed of uh, their attitude after the war. Mm. Right. Uh, there was the question about this, the school books, how uh, this recent story is taught uh, to your children. I would like to know uh, if there is a dialogue between you and your children, between the younger generations from the former um, Yugoslavian republics. Is, can you already talk about what happened? Yes, of course. In, in my discussion, I always, I always, I want him to know, my children to know the things like they were without uh, uh, nationalism, without uh, um, uh, bad thoughts or everything else, without hate, just loving the people like they were. Uh, I don't, as when I said about, uh, I, don't, I don't have the answer about how ex-Yugoslavia is presented in books, but the new history of Kosovo is presented like it happened and like some, sometimes historians write that uh, they are very okay, but I just don't know about the time before, uh, during the during the 80s or during the 90s. Uh, it's strange, it's strange because children, it's hard to understand what happened. And um, you try to explain it, them in, uh, in the light way, in a light manner, in a, very, in a way that they can understand. Maybe later when he will be grown more, he will be older, he will understand it and we will talk it for about it in uh, for really what happened. Okay. What about your children, Zoran, and the younger generation and the the way of talking about what happened? Is there an interest? You said that a lot of young people leave just the country they don't want to do to go to Germany, they want to go to Ireland. Um, yeah, who stays in the country? Yeah, um, most of them actually they're sick of everything, especially they're sick of stories. You mm -hmm. know, uh, they really don't care. Wait, you know? What do you mean? What do you mean? Sorry, Zoran, what do you mean by stories? What do you mean? Yeah, when I say the stories, I, I'm talking about the stories about you know what I, what I previously say. You know. Uh, the main topic in Croatia is always the Serbia is the ba uh, the Serbians are the bad bad guys. They start war in Croatia, and we are poor today because there was a war in Croatia. And 
no one actually can buy this story anymore, you know, because there was a 30 years after war. Mm -hmm. 30 years has passed, you know, uh, and, and the people, they're still, uh, I mean, when I say people, I, I, I mean politicians, they're still talking about the war. There's the, how to say that, they don't have idea how, how, to, how to lead the country. Actually, they rule the country just because they, they are thirsty for, for power and money. And that's all, actually, there's no ideas. I was in Ireland for four years. There's completely different story. The, the, uh, those politicians actually thinking about people, about prosperity, they make plans, they will be realized in next 30 years, maybe. Mm. Here in Croatia, there's no such thing, you know, the people, I mean, politicians talking about just about uh, low vibrations, if you know what I mean, you know. So the young people are really sick of that because young people, they finish the schools, uh, they finish the colleges, and they, they can't find a job mm. because the job is already took by someone who is, who knows someone, you know, who is connected with, with someone. So that's the reason actually why the, why the new generations of creations actually are, are not, not even interested actually in the past, you know? Uh, talking about my children, my children are already grown. My son is 29 and my daughter is 25. They live in Ireland and I'm not sure actually if they want to get back in Croatia. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but there's one thing actually talking about European Union and everything about it, you know, uh, someone has mentioned actually expectations in Croatia from European Union. So if, if I have a time, I would like just to add a few sentences about it, okay? Okay. So <clears throat> uh, expectation from European Union in, in Croatia, actually, there was a very important topic, uh, but thing is that People, uh, people see that on this way. So European Union is driving by the economy. And actually, I'm not sure that European Union can do anything about human rights in, in, in the member states. So let's take Poland as an example, you know. So I'm not sure what the European Union can do about reducing a woman's rights in, in Poland. You know, so actually mm. Poland has, it's often problems to deal with uh, on its own, just as Croatia. But on the other hand, there's a good story about European Union. Uh, mm. Thanks to European Union, there was a recent uh, indictments for money laundering, uh, the money taken from European Union funds in Croatia. So under the investigation, there's a former Croatian min uh, minister of European Union funds and that's the great news because the same former minister was only a few years ago under an uh, investigation in Croatia, thanks to independent journalists, of course, but all charges was dropped. So that's the, how political mafia in, in Croatia does their job. But thanks to European Union, that person in, uh, is now closer to justice. Okay, all right. well, thank you. Um... There's one more question uh, from the audience and, and pretty soon we will, in five minutes, open the mic uh, of everyone so we can have this uh, moment together. So it's a question from Jürgen Schwarz. Uh, it's a question for Blerina. Is religion, religion an important factor in your country, both within the Albanian language population and in regards to the Serbian-Albanian relationship? Now there may be an influence from outside in this direction. Um, ninety <clears throat> percent of uh, population in Kosovo is Muslim, but uh, just uh, a little percentage of them uh, follow the religion. Uh, me, I was I was raised in a city and in a family that didn't follow. We are. I am. Muslim familiary, but uh, we don't just we it doesn't have that importance that may have for others. Um, in according according to Serbian uh, religious narratives, 
we we have seen a lot of uh, things we have seen a lot of uh, news what uh, <clears throat> orthodox clerical did uh, what language he used and what uh, narratives he used about kosovo for them kosovo is uh, is a heart of uh, serbia and is uh, a saint place is a uh, heart of their past or something like that. And uh, I think that uh, the head of uh, Orthodox Church just uh, is putting uh, is putting a fire just to grow up. And uh, for Serbs is very, I don't I don't understand a lot. I don't know it, but uh, it's uh, it's totally different like it is for, for me or for people that surround me. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, I had, maybe if I have one more minute, I had one general question, uh, which I think could be, could be important actually. Do you think we've, heard, we've learned anything, any lessons from the past, one way or another, to both of you? I know it's a very wide question, but... Um... It is very wide, yeah. Um, I don't think so, unfortunately, because mm. we already... We are already in situation like this one, you know, and we didn't... I'm speechless, actually. Mm. Yeah, when we're talking about that topic, I'm completely speechless. Uh, but let me let me tell you something about future. Uh, if I have to describe the uh, situation in Croatia right now, and there was one of questions actually from audience. Uh, in Croatia, people are afraid for the future. They're really afraid for the future because it's uncertain. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that's the, not the bad news. The bad news is that a significant number of people stopped worried completely because they become hopeless. They no longer believe. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear the words. They hopeless. Uh -huh, okay. Without any hope. Okay. No longer believe in anything. Even young people. No, no, no. I talk oh. about my generation. Okay, your generation only. Okay, but that's talking uh, about my generation. Mm -hmm. And uh, guys, uh, unfortunately, something uh, has come up to me now, and I have to leave you. Okay. So okay. I want to thank Katya and uh, for invitation and uh, all of you nice people for this meeting. Uh, stay healthy and take care. All right. Okay. Thanks so much for being with us tonight and for all your. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Prerina, do you want to, if you, are you inspired by the question? If not, we will, I think, open the mic. What? The main issue that we learned from the past is not to allow to happen it again, if we have the force to do it. The main issue that others should do is not to repeat it and uh, I don't like to say that I am one of kind of people that I'm I really I really don't hope for a better future because I have my uh, personal reason to to feel like that uh, because I, I couldn't I couldn't uh, uh, I couldn't rely, I couldn't, I didn't find any perspective in my career to, to go my, from my career here in Kosovo, but uh, because others took the places that someone else may deserve it. But I, I really sometimes, I'm a poet and I'm a, deep in me, I'm an ide idealist and I really hope that it will be better and maybe it will be, maybe, in the near future or I don't know, we will experience that better life or that normal life.